All right, hey, welcome back to Mechanical Pros. I'm here with Quentin, and we're using this uh, Daikin VRV service checker to diagnose uh, a floodback condition. So, Quentin, um, we're hooked up to our lab out in the warehouse. Uh, we're pulling in data through the service checker. Uh, tell me what you're looking for and, uh, and what you're seeing for floodback. Sure, sure. So, just to preface this, um, floodback is by far the biggest compressor killer in, in VRV, VRF, and just conventional systems in general. It's the most commonly overlooked issue, um, and generally that's because people don't know how to find it or what they're looking for. Um, so in this scenario today, we're going to identify what flowback looks like at the outdoor unit yeah. level and what it looks like at the indoor unit level. And, and so what is exactly happening to the compressor itself when we have a floodback condition? Yeah, so basically anytime, whenever we, you hear the word floodback, or Daikin calls it wet operation, mm -hmm. that's whenever you're bringing back liquid or refrigerant to that compressor. You know, the, the, the most common thing that you hear in, in the industry about floodback is you can't compress liquid. Well, it's true, okay, for a couple of reasons. For one, you can't compress liquid. Number two, those liquid refrigerant droplets that get back to the compressor are diluting the oil as well and just think of it as like a watered down um, version of your oil. Yeah. So you're changing the viscosity of the oil so you don't have the same lubrication properties. Or you're just flat out trying to compress liquid, which can't happen, right? So ultimately, you'll break a scroll plate. Um, you know, if you're diluting the oil, then you're carrying the oil out or just diluting it. Um, you have uh, bearing damage that occurs with yeah. that. And then the next thing you know, the compressor's vibrating at the brink of failure, pipes start breaking in the modules. You know, so if a compressor fails, that's a symptom. You know, that's not the root cause of your issue. You need to investigate, well, why did this compressor fail? So if you're uh, on a job and you're changing a compressor, it's a good idea to fire up the service checker, figure out why did it fail. Yeah. You know, the first place that you always want to start is confirming sensor accuracy. You know, so put the system into the forced recovery mode, confirm that all the sensors are reading the same, okay? So if the system is not operational, all the, all the sensors should read relatively the same. You know, so if you're looking at an indoor unit, all, of, all three of its sensors should read the same. If you're looking at an outdoor unit, they should read close to ambient. With the okay. exception of, you know, like a discharge pipe temperature sensor or a compressor body temperature sensor, because they're uh, being influenced by the crankcase heater. Yeah. All right, so we're, we're hooked up. Uh, I see we got our service checker down here. We got our, I, this is, I guess, a type four service checker. It is, it is. And this is connected to our lab. This is landed on the F1, F2 out terminals of a VRV4 system. Um, so we're able to, to sit here in the, in the cozy training room yeah. and, and look at the data. So the first thing that you want to do to view the data is you want to come to display mode and then you'll click display operational data. Okay, and so this is going to present all of the data for the system that you're looking at. Okay, and so just a brief thousand foot overview before we get into um, the liquid uh, refrigerant returning to the compressor issue. Anything with an O beside it is going to either be a target or it's going to be um, an outdoor unit. Okay? Anything with an I beside it is going to be an indoor unit. Got it. So I1, I2, I3. These numbers right here don't really mean anything. They're basically just assigned to the indoor unit from your service checker. And so in order to identify one of these units, you would have to um, come back to your map, right? So I1, for instance, is going to be group address 1-02, airnet address 004. So if you have an issue with an indoor unit, that's how you would run it down, okay? So the first thing that we want to look at, anytime we're looking at any piece of operational data for an outdoor unit, is we wanna look at the mode that it's operating in, okay? So right now we're operating in cooling mode. We have three distinct modes, cooling, heating, and parallel. Mm -hmm. Cooling means that all of our indoor units are operating in the cooling mode. Heating means that all of our indoor units are operating in the heating mode. And then parallel mode means that they're, you have a mix, mixed yeah. bag. Heat recovery. Yep, heat yep. recovery system. Some in cool, some in heat, okay? So the next thing we want to do is we want to come down through our data. We're gonna scroll through and we're gonna look for something that says discharge pipe temperature. Another piece of important information that we we'll want is our condensing and evaporating temps, our suction temp, and discharge pipe temp. Okay, so with that being said, now we can calculate our superheat, our suction superheat, and our discharge superheat. These are both very uh, critical pieces of information whenever diagnosing um, 
a liquid flood back condition. Uh, we also can see which compressors are running. So right now, um, it's fan, compressor inverter one is on. All right, there we go, our rotation amount. So we have 41 revolutions per second on compressor one, compressor number two is off. And so what we'll do is we will subtract our condensing temperature from our discharge pipe temperature, and that's going to tell us what our discharge superheat is. Okay, so if we subtract um, 91 from 27, so that's gonna give us 36. Yeah. So on the surface, that's a, that's a pretty decent number, or a pretty decent number in relation to the range of discharge superheat. With VRV4, we can operate between 27 and 72 degrees. The next number that we wanna take a look at is our evaporator temp versus our suction temp. And you calculate this superheat, your suction superheat, just like you would on any other conventional system. Okay, so you'll subtract your saturated evaporator temp from your suction pipe temp. So 39.2 minus 39.2, what does that give you? That gives you somewhere really close to zero. That gives you zero, right? Mm -hmm. And so we have no suction superheat whatsoever. And so immediately, that should throw up a red flag to us, okay? We've got a big issue here. We should not have zero degrees of suction superheat. Mm -hmm. So now we have to go find out why do we have zero degrees of suction superheat? The most common offenders are gonna be indoor units and subcooling EEVs, okay? Okay. So first, we'll look at our subcooling heat exchanger gas temp and our subcooling heat exchanger liquid temp. So just to put it into basic terms, 68 degree gas cannot equivalent to 30, 39 degree suction temp, right? So yeah. we know that that's not our, our culprit. So we need to look a little bit further. Now granted, this is a single module system, so it's easy to breeze through this one. So we'll come down here to our indoor units and we'll start looking at expansion valve positions, okay? So 200, that's our minimum position. 2000 is going to be our maximum. Notice we have a full scale range over here. 2000 is maximum, 200 is minimum. So this indoor unit in particular is operating at um, the minimum position of 200 pulses, and so that's about 10%. And we're gonna look at our liquid and gas pipe temperature. Again, the gas pipe temperature, that's your, your refrigerant returning to the, uh, to the outdoor units. And so with that being said, 68 degrees doesn't equivalent to 39 degrees at your compressor. This unit right here is off. Our I2, our unit number two is off. We know that because our temperature sensors are very close to our suction temp. The suction temp in relation to your outdoor units, that's not a suction pipe temp, that's your return air temperature. Okay, so that's a, that's a common point that commonly gets uh, confused. Yeah, it's kind of confusing. But now we do have this guy down here that has some really low temperatures, 43 and 40.6. And so we're at the minimum position of 160 pulses. I know I said that 200 was the minimum, you I've worked lying. on too many three. Yeah, I'm lying. Yeah, yeah. I've worked on too many VRV threes. So VRV three, your minimum is 200 pulses. VRV four, it's 160. Yeah, this one's the 160. Huh? So we're at absolute minimum, right? And look how low our temperatures are, though, right? If you compare that to our first unit, that's at a at a, a more open position, so to speak. This one is actually absorbing some heat, while this one is not. So something's going on here. Something tells me that this position is not accurate, okay? So if we scroll back up to our evaporator temperature, we're pretty close to uh, the temperatures that we measured at our indoor unit, okay? And so with this being said, there's a couple of things that I would want to immediately look at with this indoor unit. Number one would be, is the filter clean? Okay, that's a really simple uh, thing to do. Pull the filter out, is the filter dirty? Mm -hmm. Does the unit get really quiet whenever you pull the filter out, right? If so, you have an airflow restriction. Mm -hmm. okay? Get that filter cleaned up. The next thing that you want to look at is the uh, physical coil itself. Make sure that that heat exchanger is clean and free of debris. If the heat exchanger and the um, uh, filter are both clean, now it's time to start looking at the expansion valve itself, okay? Yeah. So if you have, this is where it come, becomes really helpful to have a tool like an EEV mate or something like that where you can physically remove the valve, put it in your hand, and drive it. Probably what you're gonna find is that EEV is uh, jammed up, okay? And so what happens is whenever these EEV uh, stepper motors fail, 99% of the time they're going to fail in the open position. And so you have uncontrolled liquid refrigerant flowing through this heat exchanger, okay? And so in this particular instance, we actually have the, the EEV head removed 
from the indoor unit. Mm -hmm. And so that valve is in the fully open position. Okay, and so this is basically what it looks like whenever you have any EV failure. Gotcha. Because so you're, you're not, you know you're not doing your heat transfer over the coil, so it's either an air restriction or it's refrigerant restriction. Exactly. And it's going to be too much. Exactly. That's right. Right. Yeah. right. You're flooding the coil with liquid mm -hmm. refrigerant. Yeah. Not, re not absorbing enough of the heat from the space. You're not boiling off that refrigerant. Exactly. If you're not getting that phase change. Yep. Yep. Got so it. then that, that liquid has to go somewhere, right? And so the gas pipe on your indoor unit is connected to the suction pipe going to the outdoor unit. Mm -hmm. And so you're bringing that liquid straight back to the compressor. And so what you're essentially doing is you're going back through, looking at all the indoor units, making sure they're all jiving. If mm -hmm. one's out of, out of range, sure. that's probably where you're going to start troubleshooting. Sure. And the best, the best thing to do, um, if you know that you have a liquid refrigerant problem, um, is to actually put the system into full cool mode, turn every unit on in cooling mode, and then one by one, go through and turn those indoor units into the fan mode. Okay, so fan mode, your expansion valve should go to zero pulses. You should achieve positive shutoff, zero flow through that coil. Mm -hmm. um, if that's not the case, you give it about 10 minutes or so, allow that um, heat to be absorbed into that coil and, and heat it up, and it should go to your return air or your suction air temperature. Got it. So if it stays down below, um, you know, or right around or hovers around your, your saturated evaporator temp, that's definitely indication um, that that coil or that uh, that EV is is bleeding by. Yeah, and that's cool. that's a really common issue. So would you print this out and show a client, or what would you do? Just write it up and put it in your ticket? Yeah, usually sometimes um, with our clients that that have a, a good understanding of the refrigeration cycle, I'll take a snippet of it and and put it in a report form mm -hmm. and go talk to them uh, about it. Um, other clients, um, we might physically, you know, whenever we find the defective part, we might present it to the client. Say, hey, here's the EEV head. Here's my driver tool. Mm -hmm. You know, here's how it doesn't work. Here's a new one, and here's how it is supposed to look. You know, and yeah. so seeing is believing a lot of times, and it helps uh, customers understand the importance of why we do service checker data analysis. You know, why are, why do we want to see this stuff three or four times a year? It's it's really important. Um, it'll save you a really expensive compressor replacement. Yeah. That's great. You know, so there is some maintenance that's required um, with uh, systems as they get older, and you know. It's not always going to be the EEV head either. You know, sometimes you might have a physically damaged valve body, and a lot of times that goes back to the install process. Yeah. All right. Hey, thanks for checking us out on Mechanical Pros. Hit that like, hit that, hit that subscribe, and check us back out next time.